Welcome everyone to our event, Women's Rights in Afghanistan, a conversation with Seema Samar and Ken Roth. I'm Maggie Gates, Interim Executive Director for the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. The Carr Center specializes in research, teaching, and training in the human rights domain. We hold events and lectures, perform research, connect with faculty and fellows, and work with students to discuss pressing human rights issues around the world. Our main initiatives currently focus on the rapid evolution of technologies and their impact on our human rights, the challenges and triumphs of the racial justice movement, and our newly launched transitional justice program to push for accountability and truth surrounding international crimes and conflict. This event this evening is part of the Spotlight series on Afghanistan, which we are co-sponsoring with the Center for International Development, the Women and Public Policy Program, the Center for Public Leadership, and the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute to host conversations, workshops, and study groups within which the Harvard community can come together to discuss the current situation in Afghanistan under Taliban rule. This series presents the multi-layered facets of gender, human rights, economic development, humanitarian aid, and political dynamics that currently shape the lives of over 40 million Afghans today. It is my pleasure to now introduce our two speakers. Dr. Seema Samar is a medical doctor, activist, social worker, and human rights advocate who served as Minister of Women's Affairs of Afghanistan from December 2001 to 2003. Seema was appointed as a member of the United Nations Secretary General's High-Level Panel on Internal Displacement in December 2019. Her role as a panel member she is a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. Previously, Seema held the positions of Special Envoy of the President of Afghanistan and State Minister for Human Rights and International Affairs. Ken Roth is the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, one of the world's leading international human rights organizations, which operates in more than 90 countries. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch in 1987, Ken served as a federal prosecutor in New York and for the Iran-Contra investigation in Washington, D.C. He has conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world and has written extensively on a wide range of human rights abuses. Thank you both, Seema and Ken, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts on the women's crisis in Afghanistan. Seema, I pass it to you. Uh Thank you very much, Meggy, for your introduction and also for organizing this program. And thanks, Kent, for joining me in order to do this event together. Uh, human rights, I think, is a is a is a, a basic rights to uh, that every human being are entitled to have, no matter where they live and no matter which color, which language, which religion they practice. And I think uh, when we talk of human rights, usually it goes to the, um, the attention goes usually to the conflict countries, but I think the violation of human rights unfortunately continues in most of the countries uh, and sometimes even in the, in the very advanced countries as well. So um, the human rights situation in Afghanistan is really, really in dire uh, condition or situation. And the, or the majority of the, or the people or all the people of Afghanistan, except the Taliban themselves, are not free from fear and wants. I mean, the people are suffering from poverty. People lost all, or almost all of their uh, rights and freedom of expression, which we achieved in the last 20 years with the uh, intervention of the international community in Afghanistan, or all the other uh, human rights that we achieved in the last 20 years with the support of the international community, we lost it all together. I keep saying that the, uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan situation is a, a collective failure of everyone, including my people and my government, of course, and also the international community. Afghanistan is the only country who is 
uh, unfortunately is running without any constitution right now. It's also the only country who does not have, who, I mean, who is proud of the, the leaderships or proud of the number of suicide attacks which they kill not only military officials and personnel, but also the civilians in Afghanistan. So again, it's only the only country actually practically they, when they put half of their population in open prison, eliminate all, all of the female in the country from the social life. Uh, I think it's uh, not only from the social life, from any activities, uh, practically they are uh, uh, imposing the discrimination on half of the population based on their gender because they born as female in a country called Afghanistan. And I think they, they are unfortunately using the uh, religion as a weapon of war and as a, as a weapon to control the people. And actually women in Afghanistan seems to be um, being a woman seems to be a crime in the country because uh, they, they, they don't have any rights. I mean, rights to work is taken from them, right to education, which is a basic, basic right uh, of any human being is taken from them. They only allow the female students to go up to sixth grade and also they put a lot of restriction even for those students and for the teachers who, was, who are teaching those young, young, young girls. And, and recently they, they announced the, the uniform for the schools, the, the way they, they put for the boys in for the girls. Um, for the boys and girls, they said that their dress should be below the knee and the boys has to have the, uh, the vest similar to the, the color of the shalwar kameez. They, get, they are not allowed to wear pants or jeans in the school. This is ridiculous. No other country does this to the to the uh, the people. The only thing that the women were are allowed still to do is the uh, to be in the health sector. Although they announce in some of the cities, including including Kandahar, when they go to the hospital from their home to the hospital or to the clinic, the male member of the family has to accompany them. And they also use this very restrict patriarchy kind of uh, order and and uh, imposition of their mentality and they keep saying if the female do not cover their face then the male member of the family will be punished because of that and practically they make their the male member of the family their representative within the family and it all goes under the name of protection in keeping the honor of the family I think this is uh, this is very very new in no other country. I think experienced this, and that's why we keep saying that it is practically apartheid based on gender that no other country have seen it before. And and women cannot go to the park; they don't have the the right to to walk. And the recent order that they um, they released in Herat. They're saying that women cannot go to the restaurants. First, they said that they cannot go to the restaurant with their, even with the male member of the family. But of course, some families are resisting. And now they said they cannot go to a restaurant where they have a greenery or a, a garden attached to the restaurant. I mean, you name it, they cannot go to the park, they cannot go to a shrine, they cannot really wear the dress they want. Everything is controlled by them. And they even announced or released the, the statement that they, the pharmacy cannot sell the contraception because it's the conspiracy of the uh, enemies of Islam who want the population of Muslim to be, uh, to be reduced. I, I think this is a, a very clear discrimination against women and then that discrimination began at home. So they put women in the inferior position than the, the, the men in the superior position. So the conflict starts within the family 
increasing of the uh, domestic violence, increasing on, on forced marriages, increasing on, on child marriage in the country, um, arbitrary arrest of those girls who protest or do not wear properly what they want, the Taliban wants them to wear. But I have to say still under this harsh, harsh condition uh, with the arbitrary arrest, torture, uh, um, beating on the street is very, very common actually. Uh, still, there are female, young female generation who resist in the country. So I would like to say that uh, in my, uh, in my in current discussion on the, it is not a problem of only of women in Afghanistan, it's a problem of every family in Afghanistan and all the people in Afghanistan. But beyond that, I think it's a problem of humanity because this problem will not stay in Afghanistan. We already see the, the empowerment of patriarchy in our neighboring countries. So it is a problem of humanity and we all have responsibility to talk about it and not only to talk and condemn, to take action against this uh, action uh, and against this violation of human rights. Unfortunately, I saw the news, I hope it's not uh, true, that uh, someone in the, in the United Nations office in New York um, proposing that a Taliban should be recognized because to, to have a dialogue with them. And it is really sad because all the countries, including the US and uh, NATO countries who were involved in Afghanistan are trying to normalize the situation. And it is sad because the foreign minister of, of Iran is trying also to support their brothers uh, uh, mentally uh, by saying that the Taliban has rightly our concern about the situation of, of uh, women education and women security in Afghanistan. So they are supporting each other and trying to be uh, um, supportive of each other's idea and, and mentality. So I think this is a very dangerous, dangerous approach to overall uh, situation in Afghanistan, and it's not going to stay only in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, it will reach to the other countries. And I stop here and waiting for um, other comments or questions to 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 answer. Well, thank you very much, Seema, for those opening comments, and thank you for being such a courageous and outspoken defender of the rights of the women in Afghanistan for for so many many years. I mean, it's a it's an honor for me to. Um, to see you again and to, to serve on this panel with you. Um, I think you've done a, you know, a good job of outlining you know, what really is you know, extreme gender persecution, gender apartheid um, for the women and girls of Afghanistan. I mean, this is an extraordinary regime that it does not have parallels any place else in the world. And what I wanted to do maybe to open the conversation is to talk a little bit about um, what can be done um, you you know you have a sense of the Taliban. Um, you know they strike me as extraordinarily, you know, unconcerned about the welfare of the Afghan people. You know they they clearly are ostracized by most of the world. A lot of the aid has been cut off. Um, people are suffering. You know they their the economy is plummeting. But they the Taliban seems so committed to their retrograde vision, their interpretation, the extreme interpretation of Islam that they're just putting up with all of this. And do you have a sense, you know, is there um, a point of leverage with the Taliban that other governments could use? You know, is there, are there divisions among Taliban leaders that can be exploited? You know, is there some avenue of pressure that would be productive to deploy? Well, uh, Kent, it's so nice to see you after so many years and, and I, uh, I have to say that I'm one of those people who really respect you because of your commitment to human rights and promotion and protection of human rights, including in my country, because it's, it's a universal pro problem. It's not only in Afghanistan. I think, yes. One, I think the, the Taliban regime should not be recognized in any price. We should avoid this uh, normalization of, of the situation. 
Number two, I think the, the um, humanitarian relief program or humanitarian um, services should be provided through maybe Afghan NGOs if, if they do not allow the, the female staff of the United Nations. But if we should not give up on that. We should pressurize as much as possible in order to convince them to allow the women to work uh, in, in everywhere, not only at the UN, but UN was the last, the last minute cancellation. So it is really dangerous. The third point, I think, support the civil society, raise the awareness and call the whole overall issue as, as, a, as a crime against humanity. It's not really a, uh, only putting up on women under, under open prison, but it is something that the, the other, the other uh, group such as Taliban is learning. I mean, no doubt why uh, Al-Shabaab is doing all these uh, same kind of attitude against women. Why Boko Haram is, is uh, taking hostage all the way, all the time, the girls from Nigeria? And why the ISIS does in, in other countries, in Syria, in Iraq, and, and currently in Afghanistan? So I think that is uh, something that we all can do. But the, the other point that I really insist, we have to push for accountability and justice. I mean, one of the reasons that the regime in Afghanistan failed, not only the Afghan regime, the, the international community failed, and generally everybody failed, is because of lack of accountability and justice. And you know that we were fighting for this promotion of accountability and justice, including your, your uh, work with the Human Rights Watch for this for so many years. And how can we normalize with the people who are proudly announcing that they have committed more than 1,000 suicide attacks and how many people were killed and mostly civilians because of their suicide attacks? And how can we normalize people who announce that they will have a battalion at the Ministry of Defense uh, to be ready for suicide. I mean, they commit torture, they commit all arbitrary arrest, they commit, I mean, you name it, they commit everything. Killing of the people without, without any, any fair trial or, or without any reason. And the way they, they really deal with the woman who does the protest. I mean, I really salute the, the woman who still continue to protest even not wearing the burqa is a protest for me. It's a civilian, inobedient kind of a, uh, approach to the, the whole issue. Um, and the civil society should be supported and we should not give up and continue to, to pressurize and use every possible means to convince them. And not right. them, but the countries who are supporting right. them. Right. Let's, if I could, I'd like to sort of maybe, um, you just touched on a number of different areas. So let me try to take them one by one. Let me start with the question of the, um, the international humanitarian organizations that have been told no more female staff, you know, which of course, you know, in a conservative society means you probably are not serving most women, you know, yeah. and, and understandably the international organizations have been saying, you know, no, we're, we're, not going to do that. Um, and so for the time being, I think the position is that most of them have just stopped their operations saying the only way we can really serve the people in need, including the women and girls, is by having female staff. Mm -hmm. So that's the position. Now, Seema, you were suggesting that one option would be for them to deliver aid through Afghan NGOs. But do Afghan NGOs face the same restrictions? Or I mean, I, I was not aware that women were able to work for Afghan NGOs either. Yes, I mean, the, in the big cities, they are a restriction, but I think in the local areas, in the different um, parts of the country, they can easily um, kind of uh, deal with the local, local authorities. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Because I mean, the, the main focus is actually, unfortunately, is in the in the big cities. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, one principal position would be for the international groups to say, wherever women are allowed to work, even if it's just for an Afghan NGO, we will deliver aid to that NGO. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's fine. Um, but let's take the cities. Let's assume that the Afghan NGOs in the cities are not allowed to employ women. It then presents a dilemma because this is a poor country, much poorer than it had been because of the Taliban's repression. There is genuine, quite urgent need for humanitarian assistance on the part of many people. And is um, I think it's a dilemma for the international group. Now, they're in essence, what they're saying is, you know, if you don't allow this us to respect this basic principle of gender equality, we are just not going to provide assistance. But that does mean suffering for ordinary Afghans, to which the Taliban seem pretty much indifferent. But is that is that the right position to take, do you think? Or is there something else that should be done? No, I think it's the right position. They have to insist on the principles because when we break the principles, when we undermine the principles, then there's nothing to fight for. Mm-hmm. So I think, but... There are ways, in different ways, people find their ways how to deal. Because as you know that I was running into during the first Taliban regime when they put uh, um, restriction and sanction on the Hazarajat uh, during 1970, 97 and 98. I mean, we were, we were trying to help people and we got some money, we bought, I'm just telling about that that project. We bought wool from the families because they have some sheep. And we asked the other woman to to, um, to spend them. And then we give it to another group of families who did to wave blankets. And then the blankets were deli- were distributed for relief program for the refugees who came from Iran or Pakistan or for flooding or any other humanitarian crisis or, or disasters in the country. So there are ways to do that. I think one of those ways, I just mentioned one simple, but this is possible to continue still in the country. We don't have to make a big announcement and an advertisement that we have women working for us. And we did this actually. And I was surprised. We, I'm not surprised, and I'm I'm saying that what we were doing. I mean, the the NGO that I was running, we were we had with all these programs, we had literacy courses, and the literacy courses were taught by men because we didn't have an, enough female. Today we have a lot of female. They cannot control every household and every even in Kabul city. We, they cannot control every household. But they are more in, in control in the big cities rather than in the outside of Mazar and Kandahar and Herat and uh, Kabul. Jalalabad so so, but not really. Uh, they are not very much in control. So those are the ways that we, uh, but it is important for the international um, NGOs and the UN agencies to identify those groups and really be honest on the, on the, um, a proper mechanism of of monitoring because we created enough um, enough corrupt people and we should not should avoid to continue the corruption and make some people rich. All right, well, thanks. That's a, that's an interesting kind of very practical on the ground approach to it. I, I appreciate that. Um, let me ask you about the state of education because um, I mean, as you mentioned. Um, Girls are only allowed to go to school through about sixth grade. Um, They've now been barred from secondary school. They're barred from university. And the Taliban rhetoric periodically talks about this as being kind of a temporary or transitional restriction. Um, What's that about? Is there any evidence that that's true? Or is that just to make their ban on and women and girls going to school more palatable but pretend it's just temporary? Well, I think they were saying the same thing then from 1996 to 2001. 
they were saying when we um, disarm everyone, then the, the security is ready, the girls would go to school. It's very, very difficult to trust. The reason I'm saying that that's why we have to use every possible means in order to give possibility for the girls to learn something and to get knowledge. What has, I am really concerned and afraid is that even for the boys, they are training them as a Taliban. Mm -hmm. So if they have their open their official schools, if we do not put pressure on them, they will train their females as a Taliban because we had the experience when the Human Rights Commission released a report in 2014 or 13 even, with these female madrasas in the north of Afghanistan, because those girls who were going to those madrasas, they were fighting with the family member not to watch television. So we released the report, we released the concern. We fought, I personally fought with the USID, don't support these kind of uh, madrasas. But unfortunately, they did. Now, I think the, there is, compared to 2000, 1990s, we have a lot of female who are educated. We can help them and support them to teach the others at home, even if they teach three, even if they, they, they teach 10 or 15. I think the homeschooling is, they cannot stop not to teach your sister or not to teach your cousin. So those are the possibilities that we have to find a practical way and do it. Because no one can take the, the, um, the day passes, the, the, uh, the time passes, take back. The, the girl's already lost two years. And if we wait and hope that this, I mean, the, the reason I'm saying that the normalization, some people or most people keep saying that they are young Taliban who are better and they're the elderly and more conservative. I think they are all Taliban. They're all were involved on those international crimes and continue to do. So we should not put hope on that. I mean, it might be possible, but it, we should. I, I personally think that we should not prefer one criminal to another criminal. No, you make a very good point that um, it's important to find practical solutions now even if they're small scale solutions, because we don't want to lose a generation of girls. You know, education is something that, you know, just dissipates if you don't pursue it, you know, and, and a year or two gap could mean a gap forever. So it is important to find ways, however, to keep that going. I think you also seem to make a very good distinction, you know, among types of education. We tend to discuss the issue of, of Afghan girls and women as if it's education or not. But by pointing out, you know, that madrasa education can be a very doctrinaire ideological education, which can be almost counterproductive. I mean, that's that's a good point, and that you know we need to be focusing on you know quality education, non ideological education, you know, something that was more akin to what Afghanistan offered for the last two decades, um, and not just Taliban indoctrination. So these, I think, these are important points that you make. Let me push you a little bit on, um, you know, I mean, yes, all all Talibs are participants in these crimes. But I mean, our, our aim should also be, you know, if there is such a thing as a distinction between different types of Taliban members. And I don't know what that line is, whether it's, you know, urban rural, whether it's, you know, some that were kind of involved in the international negotiations and others who were not, but there at least there is, you know, talk, rumor of there being divisions within the Taliban. And, um, you know, I mean, keeping in mind your argument that we shouldn't, you know, they're still, they may all be criminals, but um, if these differences exist, it suggests that we should be trying to play to, you know, kind of less repressive elements. And that, you know, while we try to provide education, or we try to provide humanitarian assistance through NGOs, um, we should also be trying to push the least bad Taliban in a positive direction. <laughs> is that is that worth looking at, or do you think that's just hopeless? Uh, well, I mean, I, as a human being, we, I cannot really ignore completely that the people will not change. But what I'm saying is that it's almost two years that we trying to play with this game that the young um, 
the young generation is better than the, the older generation. But do we see any difference? Uh, this is one question. The second thing is that, I mean, this was same during the, the first round of Taliban. I remember when Parvez Musharraf was lobbying for moderate Taliban uh, and extremist Taliban. But where are those moderate Taliban? And how we can, I think that the mistake is that the Mujahideen was quite bad in 1990s when the Taliban took over and they, the, the people were somehow happy because people were really suffering under the complete anarchism of the, of the um, Mujahideen in the country. So they were hoping that the Taliban were promising that when we meet to take over all of Afghanistan and disarm everybody, then we will really bring a, a good Islamic country. Which kind of Islamic country do you give example of Saudi? Do you give example of Iran? Because this is the same kind of a, uh, discussion that we were making. So now they have their even super Islamic government than Iran and uh, Saudi. Mm -hmm. We see some signs in Saudi. I don't know. It's maybe it's a political act by someone, but now it's 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 ultra ultra Islamic. Even they don't recognize Saudi and Iran as Islamic countries. So which one? I mean, there were a lot of kind of a hope that Indonesia is a good country. As soon as Indonesia was support trying to mediate between Taliban and the Afghans, you remember they start flashing women in public? So they really learn from each other. So I, I think it, it's, it doesn't have an, it doesn't do any harm if we look on those issues, but we should not really forget that time passes and we don't see any changes within. We all know that Haqqani group was different from the Taliban. And that's why they ran and they came first in Kabul, this time when they took Kabul. Mm -hmm. um, but they were the one who were attacking every, every civilian, uh, places and proudly taking the responsibility. Can I ask you, you're, I mean, you're um, very well placed to um, think about the Taliban in historical terms because you, you know, you lived under them in the past and you've um, seen them now. And is, um, to what extent is this a different Taliban? We've talked about a lot of the similarities, but do you see any ways in which they are trying to restrain some of the horrible practices from their last rule? I mean, for example, my impression is that they've been, you know, a bit more tolerant of the Hazara than last time around. Um, that you know, certainly they have not started the public executions, and hopefully never will. Um, is you know, do you see any evolution in the Taliban, any moderation just between the last time and this time? Well, they had one execution in Farah. Uh, the difference I see, of course, they use the media now, they use the telephone, they use the photograph, they use, they allow people to watch television, but of course they do not. They stop the music and uh, and all those. They had one public execution in Farah. And if you look, you cannot find a single uh, picture of that scene. And because they are trained more to control people. The public lashes that they did in different parts of the country. I think it's, uh, it's so conservative society, even with, with the achievement that we had with the, um, our international partner in the last 20 years. But to lash men, young men and women in public 
they cannot live in that community again. They will be, they have to be to leave that area. Somehow it's a stop now. I don't know what's the reason. Because of the maybe outcry by the by the people also. For the Hazaras, I, I don't know what is the tolerance to them. Yes, it's they have not executed them, but the suicide attacks against the Hazaras continue. So uh, last time in 1990s, because of the, the, the loss of Taliban, of course, in Mazar, this time they didn't resist. Mm -hmm. So the place they resist in, in Balkhab uh, was really harsh. They displaced a lot of people. A lot of people were executed. The people are afraid they cannot really share the information with the, with the others because they find people from the, if they write something on the Facebook and punish and arrest. So they are not, as long as there's no resistance, I mean, with obedient, who who have a problem with obedient? You know, they have problem with the one who resists. Right, right. So they don't have problem with the people who are in the graveyard. And Seema, when you say that there have been um, suicide attacks on the Hazara community, uh, my impression was that, that was ISIS. Is that mistaken? That it was like not Taliban, but ISIS that was doing the suicide bombings. Yes, Kent, but it, it is another generation. It's another model. Mutation of the, let's say, of the, the same group. It was... But they're rivals now. I mean, a, a Taliban is trying to control ISIS. Well, right. like, I am afraid. Remember this. I'm really afraid that they use this ISIS and ISK issue as a reason to, to attract the solidarity of the international community, including Americans to them and We're claiming they are ISIS. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who can put a difference between ISIS and Taliban? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, if I could, I wanna come back to your point about accountability. And, you know, I mean, interestingly, Afghanistan is, there is international criminal court jurisdiction. You know, mm -hmm. this is um, you know, one of the reasons why Trump imposed sanctions on Fatou Ben Souda, the former ICC prosecutor, because she was willing to investigate U.S. torture in Afghanistan. So, you know, Kareem Khan, the new prosecutor, has says, okay, we're going to forget about the past. He's going to just look forward looking at Taliban and ISIS abuses. That's what he's going to focus on. So there is theoretically an investigation. Um, I have no idea how actively he's pursuing it. You know, he certainly is much more engaged in Ukraine than he is in Afghanistan. Um, but if he were to issue charges, um, there wouldn't be any imminent prospect of arrest. You know, I can't imagine the Taliban surrendering anybody to the Hague. So if it's, you know, that state of affairs, formal charges against certain Taliban leaders, um, but that's it. Would that matter to the Taliban? Well, I think Kent, it's it's I have to say that I, I am really not agree with the, the, the idea of Karim Khan in this case, because we keep saying that we let's forget about the past in Afghanistan. And we don't see any any improvement on accountability and justice. So how can you, I mean, as we have a proverb in, in Persian that you put the foundation wrong. Mm -hmm. The, the fo foundation in Afghanistan was put and built based on lack of accountability. And how many times you want to collapse to see the collapse of the, of the system and lack of accountability because Okay, the I was I was bagging to the Americans saying that you have this judiciary system and you can deal with the war crimes and crimes against humanity if it's done by your people. You know all about it. And when Karzai and President Bush signed that agreement between Afghanistan and, and the US that we they cannot Afghanistan cannot introduce any of their their people or citizen, American citizen, to any court or 
cannot hand over to anyone. They can do their own cases because it's it's a shame if we accept uh, international crimes committed by our citizen and we, I mean, there's no pride on it. So now in, ca in the case in Afghanistan, Afghanistan joined ICC in 2003. And we want to forget about those and, and coming only for the current. And then the current Sirajuddin Haqqani is not doing suicide attack. No, I, I should make clear, Sima, I, I agree with you that Kareem Khan was just being political. I mean, his, his looking forward, not back, reminded me of the way Obama responded to Bush's torture. You know, we're not going to prosecute the past torture. We just will make sure we don't do it in the future. You know, it was just a political move. Obama didn't want to, you know, spend the political capital to prosecute the Bush torturers. Kareem Khan does not want to infuriate the United States by potentially investigating you know, U.S. torturers in Afghanistan. So his cheap way of doing that was to say, we're going to look forward, not back. So that's not a principal position. That is his reading the tea leaves. You know, he's trying to just avoid pressure. Um, so I agree with you that that was not a principal thing to do. But that's also where we are. So, um, you know, leaving aside the question of the past, and I would love to see it pursued, but I don't think it's going to be, um, would a, you know, charges of contemporary abuses, would that be meaningful in trying to deter the Taliban at all? Well, yes, if they if it's really a pressure, because I think as I, the way I'm thinking about the ICC and the politicization of the overall accountability, then why Taliban should afraid? Why should they should kind of uh, control themselves not committing uh, crimes, although they do every day? I mean, you know that they, they, they open the prison and release everyone. Now they have around 12,000 to 13,000. They themselves confess that they have that much. And what is those? I mean, they say we don't have a political prisoner. We only have moral prisoner. And 13,000 moral prisoner and nobody, I mean, you know, I don't know how much they have access to those prisoners because there are no other mechanism to, to, to monitor. And the, the Human Rights Commission is not there anymore to, to monitor. And we saw how the Afghan government was, was dealing with the, the whole case and how much our monitoring has an impact uh, um, on their behavior. So there's no mechanism of, of uh, monitoring. It's only your normal, and I, I don't think they're allowed to see a lot of people uh, or a lot of uh, detention centers. So it's, it's very, very delicate. Uh, and I think the the, if Taliban claiming that the, the people are supporting, if Taliban is, is claiming that they, they have um, welcomed by the people, why they are afraid to, to go for, for um, a proper democratic process? I, I and why, particularly why they are afraid to put the woman in prison. Yeah. Is it not a crime crimes against humanity? Because it's the sexual gender-based violence is on, not always rape. Oh, no, I agree. No, I think that, I mean, these are clearly crimes of persecution. These are crimes against humanity. I agree with you. Um, so, no, there's no shortage of crimes that, that Kareem Khan could pursue. Exactly. I just think he gives it some attention. You know. Gender apartheid is good enough. Yes. yes. To pursue. Um, so, so, Seema, let me, um, I don't quite know how this works, whether we can get... Um, viewers to ask questions. But let me just sort of encourage people to do that by typing it into the chat. Um, and I think Emily can arrange for us to, to see them. Um, I'm gonna ask just one more question and hopefully we will get some questions from the audience. Um, what I wanted to ask you about shortly after the Taliban took over, um, really I think a product of the US treasury sanctions on the Taliban, there was a so-called liquidity crisis in Afghanistan where you know, even people who had money in the bank, there were not enough literally physical bills to go around. Um, and 
So people just didn't have cash. And you know, the nature of the, the Afghan economy where you know, so many goods were purchased from Pakistan, the, the cash was just flowing away. And ordinarily cash was coming in via international assistance to schools and hospitals, but those all were stopped because of the Taliban takeover. So suddenly people literally didn't have physical cash. Um, and and you, know, you saw pictures of there being food in the market, but nobody could buy the food because they didn't have cash. Now, my understanding is that that's eased somewhat, but I want to know, do you have a sense of just kind of where that stands now? I know the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury tried to be a bit responsive there. Were they sufficiently responsive? Or is this kind of, you know, cash starvation still an issue? Uh, well, I think that what the Taliban does, actually, they really extort money from the people under the name of, uh, of uh, duty, custom, mm -hmm. or... Uh, um, taxes, tax collection from the people. Uh, the, I spoke with my, one of my colleagues, I think you might know him, Langari is still there, who was the commissioner of human uh, at the AICRC. He said, it's a lot of food in the market, but people cannot buy it because there's no cash. Right. And he said, he himself said, he, when he goes to buy some meat, they usually put in a black plastic bag because people cannot afford to have meat. And the, even the, the butchers put the, the meat in a black bag because it's a pile of a line of people who are sitting and bagging in the street. So it, it is a very dire situation, but with the $40 million which UN was sending uh, every week to Afghanistan. That helped the, the, somehow the, um, the inflation. But again, ordinary people cannot afford. It's really, this is a very good example that the, the people who buy meat cannot really enjoy even to take that one kilo meat to their house. And this was not the case. Uh, of course, it was uh, it was kind of a false pseudo economy with the corruption of the uh, and the government and everything. But people cannot they cannot have access to their money. Most of their I had only one account that was my payroll. They they closed down. I uh, don't have access to it, and a lot of other people do not have access to their account. I mean, even if they have money, there's, there's no money. Although they recently, they said it's more than, it was it used to be $200 per week, and now it's more than $200 uh, because I think they, they are signing some of the uh, mining contract with some of the neighboring countries. And keep saying that Iran and Pakistan really benefit from the from the business with the Taliban. Although Pakistanis are not very happy because of their own Taliban and um, active yeah. in Pakistan. So I wanted to ask you about Pakistan and Emily or Maggie. If there are any questions, just please let us know. Um, just chime in. But um, you know, obviously, if, if there is you know any country that is influenced with the Taliban, it is Pakistan. You know, this was their their base for many years. There, you know, there is a Pakistani Taliban. The Taliban were, you know, sponsored by the ISI for many years. So there are plenty of ties there. Um, what is the nature of that relationship? And is there um, any positive role that Pakistan could play at this stage in trying to mitigate the Afghan Taliban? Well, I think they are not listening as, as they used to. But uh, yes, the Pakistan can play, still can play a role um, if they want. But the, the recent attack on Pakistani security forces, mainly on police or the militias in Pakistan by Pakistani Taliban, uh, it's, they are afraid that the, the, the Taliban Pakistani Taliban or in Afghanistan, and it's very difficult to distinguish who they are because of the language, because of the ethnicity, because of the 
most of them got the F1 ID card because it's not difficult. I mean, we had millions of children who who born in Pakistan. They are similar to Pakistanis. So it, it is very difficult. But Pakistanis slowly saying that the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban are not capable to control Pakistani Taliban. Right, now, Maggie, we're going to turn over to you now, I think. <laughs> Thank you both for this incredible conversation. It's just been wonderful hearing you um, discuss these incredible, incredibly important issues. Um, we do have a few questions, but I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll just highlight a couple of them. So, um, Seema, you opened by speaking of the return of the Taliban as a collective failure. Um, across the board from all sides. Um, can you say a bit more about this from your perspective? And Ken, could we hear your thoughts on this perspective from your uh, position at the Human Rights Watch? Yeah, Ken, why don't you go first? Because I... I... Yeah. <laughs> Should I say first? Yes. Well, I think... Uh... The, the history showed in Afghanistan that most of the, um, nobody has really won. Um, in my personal view, there are no winner in the war. So everybody's loser. The people who claim that we win, they lost. I mean, lose everything almost. Uh, if we look at the, the newest conflict, Ukraine, uh, nobody is winner. I mean, both sides is losing clearly. Um, and Afghanistan, it's the same. I think the, the international community, Americans in the NATO um, came to Afghanistan and claimed that they are promoting human rights. They're promoting, particularly they're supporting women's rights in Afghanistan. And then we saw at the end when it was, so Michael Zad was given the responsibility to talk with Taliban. We saw it was Zalmai's wife who was writing articles that um, the Americans are not responsible for uh, women's rights in Afghanistan. It should be the people of Afghanistan. Yes, it is the people of Afghanistan. But I think promotion and protection of human rights is moral responsibility of everyone. So now with the presence of NATO, in one point we had 49 countries soldiers in Afghanistan. For 20 years, and why the same group that was removed by the same power, why they give back the country to them after 20 years? So it is a failure. And now we, we are convincing ourselves or, or um, coming down to only condemn what the Taliban does. Is it the right approach? could have been a better um, approach to Afghanistan, one that we were insisting for years and years to promote accountability and justice and to fight against corruption. Corruption was, was one of the reasons that everything was failed. And, and, and I think Afghans were not the only corrupt people in the, in the case of Afghanistan. It was other people who were involved, unfortunately. And, and did they took any action against the corrupt people? Those corrupt people brought their money to, to the US, to European countries. Who is prosecuted because of the corruption? They came with their wealth. Sorry, that was... No, no I, look, I, I agree with Seema. I think the, um, I mean, it's a very complex issue and I'm, just, I'm not sure I'm expert enough to really give a good analysis, but the, um, you know, clearly the NATO presence, which was really a U.S. military presence, uh, just utterly deceived itself. You know, they kept passing up these, you know, optimistic reports of what was going on, pretending there was much more of a viable Afghan army than there really was. Um, you know, much of it, as Seema was described, was held together by corruption, um, but corruption doesn't create a professional force. You know, corruption buys 
loyalties of convenience that just wilt away when you know suddenly the the money is turned off. And you know, I, it it is worth asking, you know, how for two decades the U.S. government was willing to kind of put up with this wishful thinking rather than you know, a kind of hard-headed analysis of what was going on. Because this was, you know, from a military perspective, it was an utter failure. You know, there was no Afghan army that was created at the end. Now, you know, the 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 good part about the 20 years is, um, you know, for two decades, Afghans did live with much greater freedom. Um, you know, women did have much more open, you know, lives. Um, many people got educated. Um, there was a vibrant media. I mean, I remember I did a, a press conference in Kabul at one point. I was shocked by how many TV cameras there were. I was like, it was incredible, you know? And they're all like tiny little TV cameras, but still, you know, just like there was this incredible diversity of media, which was wonderful to see. You know, there was all the civil society. Um, now, you know, that's gone, but the experience isn't gone. You've got, you know, many, many Afghans who have lived with that, who now have a very tangible taste of what freedom means. And you know we, we can only hope that this continues as as a significant political force within the country that somehow pushes the Taliban to mitigate their repressive rule. You know I, I, I'm not you know super optimistic about that, but that is I think the you know the one avenue of hope. We have to recognize that there is this powerful force within Afghan society that is the product of the prior 20 years, and that that was the one good part of this era even if the, you know, the corruption and the, the facade of a military was a complete and total waste. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the one thing that the Taliban, of course, take the, the uh, freedom of the people and take the, uh, violate the rights of the people, but they cannot take the knowledge from the people which they gain. The only thing that I try to satisfy myself with the saying that the human rights values that was spread in the country has not been taken, cannot be taken by the Taliban, the knowledge. The, the rights are already taken, but the knowledge about their rights is not possible to be taken by the Taliban. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to continue that. It's not enough. What can we do? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, one, I think, please continue to um, to have programs on, on this issue because people are forgetting mm. and new students, uh, the students in the, in the Harvard or most of the students who are younger than 9-11, they don't remember what was happened. And, what, and it, that was not happened by the Afghans. That was happened by the people who've been in Afghanistan or who've been trained in Afghanistan or who had a somehow connection with the people who were living in Afghanistan. The second point is that we need to raise this issue by saying that the human rights is not a Western value, it's a value, it's a human value and it has to be everywhere. And we, as, as a human being, we need to, in order to protect our own dignity, we need to fight for promotion and protection of human rights in the other part of the world. Third, I think, is that we cannot have a prosperous, developed, sustainable peace without respect for human rights and clear cut. And that cannot be happen with one gender. Clearly we cannot fly. I mean, even the drone cannot fly with one wing. Mm. It requires even the drone, which is with not the human, I mean, human is not sitting in the, in the drones, but it requires two wings. That's why we're saying that the, the two main gender, I'm not trying to ignore the others, but the two main gender is the two wing of every bird or every, if human being wants to fly. Mm -hmm to be prosperous. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Seema. Thank you so much, Ken, for this conversation. And thank you everybody online who's tuned in. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Uh, good Bye -bye. to see thank you. Thank you, Seema.